Okay, I think it's terrific that uh, you're all giving your personal testimonies here. I've given you bits and pieces of mine, but if you want to see the complete story, it is online. You can check it out there. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the origin of life. Yesterday I talked about evolution, but I'm going to give you a simpler approach. And uh, I mentioned yesterday that, you know, as I engage evolutionary biologists that are convinced there's a naturalistic explanation for the history of life on planet Earth, it's always good to say, well, uh, it's interesting about the progression of life on planet Earth, but tell me about the origin of life. The origin of life is a much simpler topic to deal with when you're engaging people who are not yet believers than the history of life. Because all we're dealing is taking physics and chemistry and trying to make biology. Once you've got biology and try to advance the biology, you're dealing with something that's orders of magnitude more complex. And here's the challenge that you can say to the naturalist. If you can't solve the simplest problem in the origin and history of life, what makes you think you've got answers for the more complex problems? The origin of life is the simplest issue to deal with in terms of whether or not life is a supernatural act or a naturalistic act. Now, you're going to hear from Fazal Rana. He's my colleague. He's a biochemist of reasons to believe. He's been with us for over 20 years. In fact, just uh, two months ago, I transferred the presidency of reasons to believe uh, onto Fazal Rana. So he's actually coming here. Uh, he's going to be giving you some in-depth material on both the origin of life and the origin of humanity and some of the theological debates there. I'm going to give you some highlights so that you'll be ready for him uh, when he does show up. And it was actually my board that told me it's time to transfer over the presidency. I've been president for 37 years. And they said, Hugh, we want you to spend the rest of your life doing research, writing, and speaking. And it's a thrill for me not to have to be involved in the administration. It was easy when we had 10 employees. It's a huge challenge now that we've got over 60 employees and we also have gone international. But years ago, Fazal Rana, and by the way, you're going to love Fazal's testimony. His name, Fazali, is actually an Islamic name. He was raised in an Islamic family. His father was an Islamic physicist. And he has a story he's going to tell you how he was trained to, to be a Muslim. He tried it, just didn't think it was working. Then he went to graduate school. Uh, to study biochemistry, and it says it's research in biochemistry which led him to faith in Jesus Christ. So just like for me, astrophysics brought me to faith in Christ, for him, biochemistry brought him to faith in Christ. He's written four books on how biochemistry argues for the existence and operation of the God of the Bible. But this is the first of the books that he wrote. We wrote it. He was responsible for half of the book. I was responsible for the other half. But we are so much in sync with one another that people can't tell which chapter he wrote and which chapter I wrote. So, Origins of Life. And I did an Origin of Life update in this book, uh, Improbable Planet. Got an entire chapter where I basically say, hey, we've got a whole book on Origins of Life, but that came out in 2014. Uh, here's an update. And so this gives an update uh, to the Origins. Those two books together will do it. And as I mentioned yesterday, when you look at Genesis chapter 1, it speaks about three origins of life, not one. And this is just an easy way to challenge the materialists and the naturalists, saying, well, you're all focused on the first origin of life. How do you deal with the second origin of life and the third origin of life? And they look at you with a blank stare saying, what are you talking about? Well, the first origin of life is the origin of life that's physical. What I've discovered in debating evolutionary biologists, they've never really thought about how do you explain the soulish features in the birds and mammals. You, know, you really can't come up with that from just physics and chemistry. You know, physics and chemistry might be able to explain conceivably the molecules that are responsible for living systems, but where do you get the mind? Where do you get the will? Where do you get the emotions? How can you possibly link that to just physics and chemistry? And then the greatest challenge of all, what about the spirit of human beings? And that's what these uh, atheists are challenged with. They're trying to explain everything with physics and chemistry. They cannot provide an adequate answer, even for a simple bacterium. But the bigger challenge, of course, is what do you do with the birds and mammals? And what do you do with human beings? Clearly, they're not just purely physical. 
they have other features. So Genesis 1 teaches uh, the origin of physical life, which I believe is Genesis 1-3. The Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters. The verb there is rahat, which means, by the way, it's only used one other time in the Old Testament. You'll see it in the book of Deuteronomy, where it describes a female eagle hovering over her newly hatched eggs. So bringing her eggs to life. Likewise, that verb rahap shows up in Genesis uh, 1, uh, 3, uh, where the Spirit of God, 1, 2, pardon me, where the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters, bringing life to the waters. Let there be light. Photosynthesis is able to take place. Uh, I believe that's the origin of physical life. Creation day five, we have the origin of soulish life. Life is not just physical, but also soulish, and it manifests mind, will, and emotions, and uh, able to share emotions uh, with members of their same species, but also the capability of emotionally bonding to a higher species, namely as human beings. And then we've got the last uh, creation of life, uh, where it creates human beings that are in the image of God, just like God is body, soul, and spirit, so are we body, soul, and spirit. But what I want to focus on this morning is the origin of physical life. This afternoon, I'm going to give you a talk on the origin of spiritual life. But today, the origin of physical life. Now, the question is this. Did life evolve from a primordial soup? I mean, if you're like me and you've been in a public education environment, I got that at a very, very early age. Grade six is where I was first taught. Life comes from a primordial soup. And then I got that every successive year following. It actually originates with Charles Darwin. What he wrote in Origin of Species is that life arose from a small, warm pond. So you got this warm pond filled with chemicals and uh, these chemicals randomly bump into one another, and out comes uh, life. Now, when I was at the University of Toronto, I took a summer course from Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan adjusted Charles Darwin's uh, model. He says, oh, a small pond's not going to do it. We need a really big pond. And so his model for the origin of life was life arose from a vast sea of concentrated prebiotic molecules that percolated for nearly a billion years. He says, Darwin said a small pond in a short period of time. Over the last 150 years, we know life is way more complex. We're going to need a huge pond, basically all the oceans of the world. And those oceans need to be filled with concentrated prebiotic molecules. And we let it percolate for a billion years. And that's where life comes from. Which leads to the following predictions about the origin of life from a non-theistic perspective you would anticipate that life would originate late after a passage of enormous time. So it's going to be at least a billion years after the first appearance of liquid water on the face of the Earth. It's going to be under benign chemical conditions. We're going to need optimal chemical conditions for these molecules to have an opportunity to interact with one another. We're going to need a huge and highly concentrated suit. So we need the world's oceans packed to maximum density with these prebiotic molecules. And we're going to need abundant homochirals. That's a technical term. And simply based on the fact that if you want to make a protein, you need to link together amino acids. But the amino acids come in two forms. One with a hydrogen atom on the left, right side, a hydrogen atom on the left side. And the only way you can link the amino acids together to make a protein is if all of them are left-handed. But in the real world, it's about a 50-50 mixture. You get the same problem with DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA, it's an assembly of nucleobases, but what links the nucleobases together are ribose sugars. But ribose is like the amino acids. It can be left-handed or it can be right-handed. And the only way you can put together a DNA or an RNA molecule is of all the ribose sugars are right-handed. So you need abundant homochirals. In other words, you need all the amino acids to be left-handed. You need all the ribose sugars to be right-handed. And the non-theistic model is you're going to get one very simple species of a microbe at the end of this whole process. Now, what about the Bible story? It says the earth was formless and empty. 
and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And as I've already mentioned, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The word rahap, which means to bring to life what is there. Basically making the point, as early as physically possible, the origin of life would occur. That's necessary in order to prepare the way for human beings. To wrap my talk last night, you realize there's a narrow time window in which we human beings can exist. So it's crucial that our God get everything in place so that everything we need is available when we hit that narrow time window. So we would anticipate from a biblical perspective the origin of life is going to happen as early as the laws of physics and chemistry permit it and it's going to be at a maximal level which means we get the following biblical predictions. The origin of life is going to happen early as early as physically possible. It will not be under benign physical and chemical conditions. It'll take place under hostile conditions. That this life is going to be complex, diverse, and abundant. We do not anticipate just one species of microbe, but multiple species of diverse microbes. It won't be just a few microbes. They're going to be super abundant. The event will be miraculous. It'll be instantaneous. There's going to be no buildup of time. It's going to happen immediately. And it's going to be marine species only. Say, so where do you get that from? Water covers the whole surface of the earth. There's no continents yet. So we'd expect the first life form, marine species only. OK, next few minutes, I want to reveal to you what we have established in the scientific record. Not what we're guessing about the science, but what is firmly established about the science as relative to the origin of life. First and one that's caught the greatest attention uh, from the non-theistic scientists is we now can prove that the origin of life happened in virtually no time at all. We're not looking at a billion years. We're not even looking at a few million years. We're looking at something that's incredibly brief. Because as we look at the moon and Mars, we see that it's cratered. You see Mercury likewise is cratered. But Mercury, Mars, and the Moon, the craters are eroded at different rates. Mercury has a very tiny argon atmosphere. Uh, the Moon also has an argon atmosphere, but even smaller than that of Mercury, whereas Mars has got a significant atmosphere. And so the craters on those three bodies are eroded at different rates. But if you look at the erosion rate, what it tells us is that the solar system experienced a late heavy bombardment. Namely, that about 700 million years after the origin of the solar system, we get this huge spike of asteroids and comets bombarding the bodies of the inner solar system. And what that does is it heats up the Earth. So here the Earth is hot enough that it's molten all over the surface. No oceans, no rocks. It begins to cool down. And there are brief episodes here we actually do get rocks and liquid water, but they're incredibly brief. And then we get this big spike where the planet heats up again, everything goes molten, then it cools down, and now for the first time, you get permanent rocks and permanent liquid water, which means you have the possibility for the origin of light. This dates at about 3.85 billion years ago is where you get the peak of the late heavy bombardment the peak of the heating up of the Earth, and we get the cooling down. But this is the date we get, for the first undisputed evidence for the origin of life. Namely, that the permanent rocks we see on the, on the face of the Earth show isotope evidence for life. And I'm going to tell you exactly what that isotope evidence is in a minute. But the date you get is 3.825 billion years ago plus or minus 0 0.006 billion, which means plus or minus 6 million years. And that 3.825, you subtract that from 3.85, that's the cooling time that's needed before you're going to get permanent liquid water and permanent rocks. How many of you ever heard of Niles Eldridge? Along with J. Stephen Gould, Stephen J. Gould, he was the one that came up with the punctuated evolution model. They're both atheists. Uh, Gould has passed away. Niles Eldridge is still hanging in there. Uh, but he wrote a book of the triumph of evolution and the failure of creationism. But this is what he admitted in that particular book. 
He said, quote, one of the most interesting facts I've ever learned is that in the very oldest rocks that stand a chance of showing signs of life, we find those signs. In other words, no time delay. The moment you got permanent rocks and permanent liquid water, you immediately have life. Moreover, we don't have life in one species form, we have it in multiple species forms. And I'll reveal to you why we now know it's not just one species, why we now know the microbes had to be abundant rather than rare, as the atheistic models would predict. But Niles Eldridge is not alone. This is universally conceded within the scientific community that the origin of life is an instantaneous event on the face of the earth. Well, at least instantaneous within our air bars, which are now down for minus six million years. Okay, so we can establish that the origin of life happens in no time at all. We can also establish that there's no soup. Now, I think you can all figure this out. If you've got no time and no prebiotics, you have no naturalistic model for the origin of life. All naturalistic models require a soup. How do we know there's no prebiotic soup? Well, we know that because living carbonaceous molecules have different isotope ratios than stuff that is not living. Uh, so, for example, your body has a greater proportion of carbon-12 relative to carbon-13. And carbonaceous molecules that don't have uh, any uh, life history to them will have a ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13. So we can tell whether a molecule is postbiotic or prebiotic just by looking at the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13. Moreover, we can check that by looking at the ratio of nitrogen-14 to nitrogen-15 because the same thing happens. Organisms favor nitrogen-14 over nitrogen-15. Likewise with sulfur. Organisms favor sulfur-32 relative to sulfur-34. So these are three independent ways chemists can look at these rocks and determine whether the carbonaceous molecules there are the result of the decay of organisms, in other words, postbiotic, or they're actually prebiotic. And what did they discover? 100% of it is postbiotic. None of it is prebiotic. Never had a prebiotic soup. If you don't have prebiotics, you don't have a naturalistic origin of life model. And incidentally, different species of microbes have slightly different ratios of carbon-12 to carbon-13. So, for example, photosynthetic microbes will manifest a slightly different ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13, nitrogen-14 to nitrogen-15. So by doing these detailed isotope studies, we can actually affirm that the origin of life was not the origin of just one microbial species. It was the origin of dozens of distinct microbial species. Aerobic uh, microbes, which basically need oxygen in order to function, anaerobic that don't need any oxygen, so you've got photosynthetic, non-photosynthetic, sulfate-reducing bacteria. And we now know from uh, a human perspective, we need all those microbes to be there 3.825, 3.825 billion years ago in order to do the necessary chemical transformation of the Earth to pave the way for humans fast enough that all this is in place by the time we enter that narrow time window in which we can possibly exist. Now, Fazal Rana and I regularly attend Origin of Life research conferences. We attend all the ones that are held in North America. Uh, the last one of those was in 2017, but we've been doing this since 1999. And uh, these are typically international meetings where they gather together the world's top Origin of Life researchers. They're typically attended by about 400. And in each one, we're the lone Christians that are there. We have on our name tag reasons to believe. And everybody asks us, well, what's reasons to believe? And they're rather stunned that we're uh, Christians that are there. They're even more stunned that we've actually written papers on the origin of life and have published a book. 
And they're even more stunned that one of the leading atheist origin of life researchers actually wrote a review of her origins of life book. It's positive. He basically said, I don't agree, I don't like this Jesus. And actually, I can give you a little added anecdote. He called us about three months after the paper. By the way, the paper is public domain. You can actually go online and read the review for yourself. It was published in the journal Origin of Life and Evolution of the Biosphere. And uh, it was uh, uh, David Deemer uh, who wrote the review. But he had a phone call with Fazal and he said, you know, I'm an atheist, but for the sake of my children, I really hope you guys have reasons to believe are right and I'm wrong. So maybe things are happening in his life. But the last Origin of Life research conference we attended, they devoted Wednesday to looking at the building blocks problem. Can we, and this is the question that they asked. Can the formation of the building blocks of life be considered as solved? And so they had five of the world's leading origin of life chemists get up and each spoke for 15 minutes on this problem. And what was interesting, all five gave the answer, no. We do not understand where the building blocks of life uh, come from. In fact, all five of them agreed, we don't even understand where the building blocks of the building blocks of life molecules uh, come from. And what we can see is not even the assembly of the building blocks of the building blocks of life is solved. Moreover, they said, we don't think it ever will be solved. Well, if it never will be solved, that means there's no uh, naturalistic origin of life possible. Now, what's interesting about origin of life research conferences, it's basically being taken over by astronomers. The first meetings we attended were by chemists. Now astronomers are beginning to take over. Why? Because astronomers recognize as a pathway to find the building blocks of the building blocks of life molecules. Because the one source in the universe where you get the richest mix of carbonaceous molecules are dense interstellar molecular clouds. And I can recall when I was still a graduate student where they were discovering the first of these molecules. The first one they found was formaldehyde. So that led to a joke. Well, uh, uh, if there's life out there, it must be well preserved because of all the formaldehyde out there. That's a very simple molecule, but today, molecules that are found in these dense interstellar molecular clouds. I've heard people saying, well, maybe life came from the comets. But where do comets come from? Comets come from dense interstellar molecular clouds. Where do the meteorites come from? Dense interstellar molecular clouds. It's really the only source uh, within the universe where you can get the building blocks of the building blocks of life molecules. Now, papers did get published in the Astrophysical Journal where they said, we think we have found a nucleobase. We think we have found glycine. That's the simplest of the amino acids. It only has 10 atoms in it. Uh, but both of those claims uh, were withdrawn. Papers were published and they said, we made a mistake. We really didn't find a nucleobase. We really didn't find uh, glycine. So there's been no detection of amino acids, ribose, or nucleobases. These are the simplest building blocks of the building blocks of life molecules, and yet we've been unsuccessful in finding any of them in the only conceivable source for these molecules, these dense interstellar molecular clouds. Now, I've been on public record. We will find them. We know enough about the chemistry in these interstellar molecular clouds that we know the chemistry is making these molecules. The problem is there's other chemical reactions in these clouds that are destroying the molecules. So they're being manufactured, they're being destroyed, and the problem is they must exist at very low levels. When we put out the first edition of our book, Origins of Life, astronomers had the capability of measuring the abundances of these molecules at one part per million. We now have telescopes powerful enough we can measure the abundances of these molecules at about 200 parts per trillion. So way more sensitive. But even so, as of right now, they have yet to detect amino acid, uh, a single nucleobase, or any five or six carbon sugar. They have found three carbon sugars. 
uh, glycoaldehydes, but they've not, riboses of five carbon sugar have yet to find a single, haven't found a four, five, or six carbon sugar. So no ribose. Uh, but I'm on record as saying it won't be long before we find them. But we're going to be finding them at tens to hundreds of uh, uh, parts uh, per trillion. At an abundance level, that molecule. You simply have way too low a density of these molecules for there to be any hope that they would be assembled. But again, at the last Origin of Life research conference we attended, there was a whole day devoted. Let's just assume we have all the molecules we need. Let's assume they're already homochiral. How can we put them together? So they've done these amazing laboratory experiments where in the lab they're actually able to link together left-handed amino acids and make a chain. You say, well, how long of a chain they're able to make? Well, about the mid-40s. Uh, but when they get to the mid-40s, and what they do is they assemble these amino acids on a clay substrate. It's the only way they've been able to figure out how to link together these amino acids in the lab. But once they get beyond 40, the problem is that this polymer of linked together amino acids adheres to the substrate with such tenacity you can't pull it off. And if you can't pull it off, it's of no value for any ordinary life uh, research model. And the longer you make the chain, uh, the greater the adhesion. And theory has been pointed out, you'll never get past 50. And if you can't get past 50, all the proteins have more than 50 uh, amino acids in them. Some of the proteins have tens of thousands of amino acids in them. And so this is recognized as a fundamental uh, block to any naturalistic origin of life model. But notice this, it assumes you have an abundance of these amino acids. It assumes that you have them all left-handed form. Our studies of interstellar molecular clouds tell us that'll never happen. But my colleague, Fazal Rana, has written a book called Creating Life in the Lab, where he says, okay, people have abandoned how does this happen on the early Earth, uh, just with physics and chemistry. They're saying, can we do it in the lab? And they've made some amazing advances. But his whole point is this. Notice it takes a highly skilled set of biochemists, highly educated, uh, highly trained, highly funded, and uh, they only work with pure chemicals. They make sure there's no destructive chemical reactions going on, only constructive reactions. He says, what does this tell us? The one that actually created life in the first place must be orders of magnitude, better educated, more intelligent, better funded, better equipped uh, than those lab biochemists, which basically means we're looking at the God of the Bible. So the polymer assembly limit is well noted in the lab. And moving on, we've got no time, we've got no soup. And back in 1999, it was a Romanian uh, chemical physicist who said, I want to explore why we've been able to find a primordial soup on planet Earth. We see the postbiotics, we don't see the prebiotics, and he's the one that actually solved the problem, why there's no prebiotic soup on the face of the Earth, and it's now known as the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. How many have ever heard of the Uri Miller experiment? Uh, at least in Canada, it was taught in all the public schools. You know, there's one where Miller and Uri had this flask, and they put ammonia in it, and methane in it, and carbon dioxide and water. And they put a spark through it, and they got a tiny amount of glycine, the simplest of the amino acids. At least in my Canadian public school education, they said, this is actually demonstrating uh, that the origin of life can happen just with physics and chemistry. But that particular experiment, they were rigorous in making sure there was no oxygen in the flask. The tiniest amount of oxygen in the flask, you get nothing. So they kept the oxygen out. And it was this Romanian physicist that said, okay, uh, if you've got oxygen in the early Earth's environment, there will be no prebiotic chemistry. But if you don't have oxygen, there will be no ozone about the Earth. And what does the ozone shield do? It blocks out the short ultraviolet radiation from coming down to the surface of the Earth. He basically said, if there's no ozone shield, you're going to get this short ultraviolet radiation coming through, 
and that short ultraviolet radiation is just as effective as oxygen in stopping the prebiotic chemistry. So that's why they call it a paradox. If you got oxygen, it can't happen. If you don't have oxygen, it can't happen. You lose both ways. Because without oxygen, there's no ozone. With no ozone, the ultraviolet radiation comes through and basically stops the origin of life chemistry. And he says, as far as whether you do have oxygen or don't have oxygen, he says the answer is you do have a tiny amount of oxygen. And he says, there's no photosynthesis going on, but the earth is filled with uranium and thorium. What I forgot to mention last night, our planet Earth is uranium thorium champion of the universe. We have 630 times as much thorium as any other rocky body in the universe. We have 340 times as much uranium. It's thanks to all that uranium and thorium, we have long-lasting plate tectonics, which makes the continents, and we have a long-lasting strong magnetic field, which protects us from having all of our water and atmosphere sputtered away by the radiation uh, of the uh, sun. Uh, but this Romanian physicist also said, with uranium and thorium, you're going to be getting radioactive decay. They're both radioactive elements. And the radioactivity will be flowing through the water, because after all, at that time, water covers the whole surface of the Earth. And so the decay of uranium and thorium is actually going to split the water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen, and therefore the water will be filled with a small amount of oxygen. The atmosphere will have a small amount of oxygen. And we're talking really small, less than 1%, uh, one, less than 1 one hundredth of a percent, but that's enough to stop the prebiotic chemistry. Even if it's 1 ten thousandth of a percent, that's enough to stop the prebiotic chemistry. And then the other big problem is there is no homochirality source. Physicists and chemists for 40 years have been trying to search for a mechanism within the natural realm where we can get homochirality. It took them a long time, but they found one. Namely, uh, circularly polarized ultraviolet light at a very high intensity will actually destroy right-handed amino acids more efficiently than left-handed amino acids. So that's what you see in the textbooks. That's where we get all the amino acids left-handed. But again, at the last Origin of Life Research Conference, there is a team from MIT and Harvard that said, we've done experiments in the labs. Yes, if we saturate these amino acids with uh, ultraviolet uh, circularly polarized light, we do see uh, the right-handed amino acids being left-handed amino acids. And so they started with this huge sample, bathed with this powerful ultraviolet circularly polarized light, but they couldn't get past 79%. Uh, left-handed and 21% right-handed. That was the limit. And they basically brought a theoretician in who said, there's no way you're going to get to 100%. Long before you get to 100%, you got no immediate because you're basically destroying both the left and the right-handed. And the problem is, before you get to 100%, you have zero sample left over. So they said, we are stuck. There's no solution to the homochirality problem. And they're talking failing to re recognize you've got an astronomical problem here, too. The only source of circularly polarized ultraviolet light in the universe is next to black holes and neutron stars. I mean, what an ugly place to try to get an origin of life scenario going. These are regions of the most deadly radiation in the universe, guaranteed to tear apart the amino acids. So yeah, you might get them homochiral, uh, but to get that circularly polarized ultraviolet light, yeah, you can generate it in the lab, but the only natural source is right next to black holes and neutron stars. Bottom line, there's no building block molecules. And the other bottom line, not one tiny simple microbe, it's an entire ecosystem. Of big microbes, small microbes, anaerobic microbes, aerobic microbes, and this is what led uh, people to say the origin of life did not happen on planet Earth. And so what did they do? They said, well, it happened on Mars. It happened on Mars, and the life went from Mars to the Earth. That's where life comes from. And that's actually a major mission of NASA to this day. You're probably aware a lot of your tax dollars 
are being sent to send these sophisticated spacecraft to the Martian surface to dig into the Martian soil and find the remains of life on Mars. By the way, I've been on public record since the 1980s. They will find what they're looking for. It's inevitable they'll find the remains of life on Mars, but not because it's indigenous to Mars. Earth has been so prolific with life that every time a big meteorite strikes the Earth, it exports Earth's soil to outer space. And some of that soil falls on Mars. Now, not much. Uh, we astronomers calculate about 20 kilograms of Earth's soil now lies on every 100 square kilometers of Mars, which means we've got a very thin layer of Earth's soil uh, on the surface of Mars. But one ton of Earth's soil contains 100 quadrillion microbes. And so our planet Earth is literally exporting life, microbial life, throughout the entire solar system. Now, I'm also on record saying we will find it on Mars, but we got a way better shot of finding it on the moon. Because the moon, being so much closer to the Earth, has received 20,000 kilograms of Earth's soil for every 100 square kilometers. So a few years back, I spoke at NASA Houston to the astronauts there and the scientists there saying the Apollo mission, its mission was to find pristine lunar rocks. And we got those rocks. But we need to go back to the moon with a different mission. Not to find the pristine lunar rocks, but to find the Earth's transported soil. And the advantage there is the moon has almost no geological activity. We'll never find the fossils of Earth's first life on planet Earth, because Earth has had so much geological activity that those fossils have been destroyed by Earth's geology. The earliest fossils we have of life on planet Earth date back 3.47 billion years ago, and they're basically parts of the microbes. And we don't even have an intact microbe that early. We got no fossils that date back to 3.825 billion years. But that was a time when our planet was being bombarded by a lot more asteroids and comets than today, and a lot of that stuff wound up on the moon. The moon has virtually no geology. We can literally go back to the moon, find the fossils of Earth's first life, and determine who got it right. Did the atheists get it right that that first life would be a single microbial species, no bigger than a tenth of a micron across? Or are the theists going to be right that it's going to be a complete ecosystem of microbes, where you've got aerobic microbes, non-aerobic microbes, uh, where you've got them a tenth of a micron and as big as two or three microns across. So what I shared there at NASA Houston is, NASA has the opportunity of going to the moon, and by the way, we don't need to send people. This can all be done with cheap machines. Go to the moon, dig into the soil, uh, analyze that, send the information back to Earth, and NASA can be on record as settling, does God exist? Did the atheists get it right? Or did the theists get it right about the origin of life? And my last words to the scientists there, I said, you know, I know you're worried about funding and public funding, but last time I checked, 100% of the US taxpayer base was made up of theists and non-theists. You could have the privilege of determining who got it right the theists or the non-theists. But a big part of what's going on in origin of life research is they're saying life originated on Mars and a meteorite took that life from Mars and dumped it on the Earth. Well, we do have 22 Martian meteorites uh, that have been recovered, mainly from Antarctica. So we do have Martian meteorites, but it is interesting, we only got 22. Uh, you get a much more efficient delivery of material from Earth to Mars than you do from Mars to Earth. Mars is a much smaller body, and so we don't have much. But that's the claim. And if you can, uh, well, you're not old enough, uh, but uh, when, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the president's name. Uh, he wound up doing a dance around a Martian meteorite that was about this big. And there was a big news story, this goes back, gee, almost 20 years, where they said, we think we found life in this meteorite. This is where Earth's life comes from. And three years later, uh, they realized that they were mistaken in all the claims. Uh, it was uh, Clinton was the president. 
And yeah, you can actually watch a video clip of him dancing around this meteorite, rejoicing with the scientists. We now know where life uh, on Earth comes from. It comes from Mars. Uh, but now all that has been disclaimed. There is no life uh, in that particular uh, meteorite. But here's a problem with the origin of life on Mars. You've got the same issue. Uh, there's no time uh, for life to originate on Mars. And you've got a carbonate crisis. And what I mean by that carbonate crisis, if you've got water and you've got carbon dioxide, water reacts with carbon dioxide to make carbonates. And that carbonate gets permanently uh, removed. And so that explains why Mars originally was warm and wet. But because of the carbonate crisis, it very quickly became cold and dry. Matter of fact, what they discovered with that particular meteorite that Bill Clinton did a dance around is that uh, it happened at a time when Mars was way too dry and way too cold, four billion years old, uh, which meant, hey, it would have been too cold and too dry. The chemicals in there really aren't the remains of life. The isotope evidence proved that it wasn't. Reason why that didn't happen on Earth, Earth has plate tectonic activity. And so the plate tectonics on planet Earth recycle the carbonates back into water and uh, carbon dioxide. But on Mars, that doesn't operate. So if you've got carbon dioxide, you've got water, it quickly gets converted into carbonates, which means the planet quickly becomes uh, cold and dry. And that's affirmed by the fact that when we look at the craters on Mars, we see that there's very little erosion. So little erosion, we realize they've never been exposed to water. So we know that uh, Mars for a very long time. And just like planet Earth, you've got the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. And uh, in the case of Mars, we know no oxygen at all because there's no ozone. The ultraviolet radiation comes through. You also got no homochrology source. You got no building block molecules. And so what happened in origin of life research, this was about a decade ago, they said Mars is not the answer. Earth is not the answer, Mars is not the answer, so they said it must be directly from these interstellar molecular clouds. The problem though with these interstellar molecular clouds, we've yet to detect ammonia. No ammonia, there's no uh, chemical catalyst to generate these molecules. As I mentioned, there's no ribose, neither are there any six carbon sugars, no nucleobases, no amino acids, no homochrology source, but don't be surprised if a year or two from now there's a huge excited announcement. We have found amino acids in these interstellar molecular clouds. What you need to do is read the fine print. If it comes in at 100 parts per trillion, this is of no value to the origin of light. If it was like 10 parts per million, maybe they'd have something. Uh, but if it's at a very low abundance level, but it will happen. And what happens, there's going to be all this enthusiasm. We have solved the origin of life problem. No, they haven't, if all they got is a low abundance. Okay. At the last Origin of Life Research Conference, they said, and again, these are people coming from a atheistic perspective. In fact, it's interesting. We would have lunch and dinner and breakfast with them, and these scientists would all get together, and they would say, well, one thing we all know for sure, there is no God. How do we solve this problem? Well, we've ruled out Earth. We've ruled out Mars. We've ruled out these interstellar molecular clouds. Uh, it must be interstellar dust that brings in the microbes and the necessary molecules that we need. However, several papers were published where they said, hey, if this dust is traveling through interstellar space, it's going to get exposed to a lot of X-ray and short ultraviolet radiation, and this is going to destroy the molecules long before they get to planet Earth. Moreover, they said they can't get here very fast. If we're talking about this stuff coming from another planetary system, we're looking at a minimum of 10 million years. In 10 million years, uh, these molecules will break down. We know that because we can take the amino acid nucleobases in the lab and measure their half-life. In some cases, the half-life is less than one hour, which means in one hour, it breaks apart and it's no longer in amino acids. And there's no way you get a transport time short enough uh, that it enters. And moreover, it's got to go through our atmosphere. When it goes through our atmosphere, it gets heated up to a minimum of 500 degrees centigrade, guaranteed to break down the molecules. Well, 
we were at an Origin of Life research conference, which went on for five days, where they said, day one, we eliminated Earth as a candidate. Day two, we eliminated Mars. Day three, we eliminated Europa and Callisto, all the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, eliminated the solar system. We eliminated uh, life coming from another planetary system or from an interstellar molecular cloud. We eliminated the dust issue. Ah, what's left? A rock brought life to planet Earth. And so the model was, if you've got a big rock being transported to us from another planetary system, where you've got a bacterium in the middle of the rock, maybe that's how life got here to planet Earth. Or maybe in the interior of that rock, uh, you've got all the amino, you've got all the DNA, RNA, and proteins that you need for life. Maybe that's how it all happened. And then one physicist got up and said, well, you're going to need a big rock uh, in order to prevent the radiation uh, from breaking down these molecules, the rock has got to be at least two meters across, and there can't be any cracks in the rock, and there can't be any pores within the rock. It's got to be a solid rock where you've got the bacterium in the dead center of the rock. That's what it's going to take for that big bacterium to get to planet Earth. And by the way, the bacterium has got to be a spore, uh, where it basically stops its metabolism so it can survive the long transport across space. But then Jay Malosh, an astrophysicist from Australia, got up and said, here's my calculation of how many rocks planet Earth has received uh, from another planetary system. And he basically said, I won't even talk about one planetary system. We're going to look at all the planetary systems in our Milky Way galaxy. And we're going to assume that every star in our Milky Way galaxy has a planetary system. We're also going to assume that every one of these planetary systems has life on it and are exporting rocks out through the Milky Way galaxy. And so he calculated what we'd expect in the way of rock derivative to planet Earth from all uh, you know, 400 billion stars uh, with planets on them in our Milky Way galaxy. And he said, we will get one rock the size of a human fist being delivered to our planet Earth every 10 to the 16 years. Well, the universe is only 10 to the 10 years old. And so he basically says you need the universe to be a million times older than it is just to get one rock the size of a human fist. And if you want a rock two meters across, you need to add an extra factor of a million. So they basically said, we got nothing left. Well, not exactly. There was one scientist that came up to the uh, Q&A microphone at the end of that conference and said, in this conference, we've eliminated Earth as a candidate, we've eliminated Mars, we eliminated all the solar system bodies, we eliminated the comets, we eliminated dust and comets coming from another planetary system, we eliminated the dust, we eliminated the rock. The only thing left is directed panspermia. Intelligent light, spaceships, and they brought life to planet Earth. In fact, he went on to say, this actually solves the Avalon explosion and the Cameron explosion. These beings from another planetary system sent spaceships to planet Earth at regular intervals. That explains the origin of life. It explains uh, the uh, origin of the uh, eukaryotes. They came back a half billion years later and brought eukaryotes to planet Earth, bacteria that actually have nuclei. They came back for the Cameron explosion. Avalon explosion. They came back for the uh, explosion of life that happened after the Triassic Permian catastrophe. It explains all the mass speciation events in planet Earth. And this actually goes back to the 1980s. Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel, two of the world's leading origin of life researchers back in the 1980s, actually proposed the answer to the origin of life on planet Earth. Aliens in spaceships came here and deposited life on planet Earth. But it raises a question. Where did these aliens come from? And because you're basically just shifting the origin of life problem away from planet Earth to some other location. You still got the no time problem. You've got the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. All the issues that make life impossible from a naturalistic perspective on planet Earth and the Mars would apply to every planet in the entire universe. Moreover, Two papers have been published in the past two years by astronomers that say they've overlooked something. 
it takes a minimum time in the history of the universe to get the possibility for intelligent life. And guess what? We human beings are here at the theoretically minimum time. It takes a minimum of 14 or 13.79 billion years for the universe to develop to such a degree that you even have a possibility for intelligent life. What they write in their paper, the extraterrestrial intelligent life after us, but it can't be before us. If it can't be before us, they couldn't have delivered life to planet Earth. Moreover, how can they possibly get here? And what I'll share with you briefly is that um, there actually is a mission underway uh, to discover what's going on on the nearest exoplanet. There's a tiny planet orbiting the nearest star, four and a quarter light years away. And so there's a serious mission underway to go to that uh, planet with spaceships. But they realize if we try to go from here to four and a quarter light years away, we're going to have to move relatively fast. If you move at one-tenth the velocity of light, you're now looking at 43 years to get there, one-way trip. So I say, maybe we need to go 20% the velocity of light. That makes it a 21-year trip. Uh, but even if you go just 10% the velocity of light, you have a very high probability of your craft being destroyed by the electrons and protons you're going to encounter on the way. And the faster you go, the more damage you cause. It's E equals mc squared. The greater the velocity, the damage goes up with the square of the velocity. But they've actually come up with a solution. We're going to send spaceships that are no bigger than 10 centimeters across. The smaller the spaceship, the less the damage. And we're going to send 1,000 of these small spaceships to the nearest uh, planet. And we already know ahead of time, based on our calculations, a minimum of half of them will be totally destroyed. The other half will be partially destroyed, but maybe they'll be functional enough that we'll actually get some information about this planet. And so that's actually being proposed, to send 1,000 tiny spaceships. But if you're sending 1,000 tiny spaceships, there's no way you're going to have life on it. Uh, you can't even put a bacterium on it. That bacterium will be destroyed on a spacecraft that small. I got a whole chapter on this in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. Why interstellar space travel is impossible for even the tiniest life form, let alone something as big as a human being. Now, this was acknowledged by the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. It's an institute of eight theoretical physicists. And they said, well, all this is true. The only possible explanation for the origin of life, there must be a hidden law of physics, a hidden law of physics that violates the second law of thermodynamics. Basically saying somewhere in the universe there is an exotic site where the laws of thermodynamics run the opposite way. This was proposed by Stuart Kaufman. However, what he's ignoring is, if that existed, it actually rules out the possibility of life in the universe. One of the conditions for life in the universe is that the universe must be uniform and it must be homogeneous, which means there's no hidden law of physics. So what are we really left with? Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. I took a little extra time. We only have about five minutes for Q&A. I'll allow more time in the next talk. Yes? So, I remember you were talking about the young Earth and the older years, and you said that it's impossible for the young Earth to have happened without uh, the laws of physics being changed. Yes. Right? But, I don't know, I feel like throughout the Old and the New Testament, when God's performing miracles, I mean, really all throughout the Bible, it's kind of defined physics in, I mean, multiple different ways. Yeah. I, I fully concede that. I mean, you've got the axe head coming up. You've got Jesus walking in water. Yeah. But notice it's God that violates those laws of physics. He's the creator. He created those laws of physics. The question is, once the universe is created, can anything that's created violate the laws of physics? And this is where we see Jeremiah 33, Romans 8 saying, no, that can't happen. And if that can't happen, there's no possibility for a young earth interpretation of the Bible or the science. So, yeah, God's in a different category. We're talking, is it possible within his creation? And according to Jeremiah 33 and Romans 8, it's not possible. Okay, yes. What's your defense for the dust on the moon problem? Yeah, 
To their credit, young earth creationists have stopped using that argument. And by the way, they've backed away from a lot of their arguments. And so, again, I credit them for the fact that they're now admitting these don't work. Uh, this is an argument that goes back to the early 1960s. And uh, this is all written up in my book, uh, A Matter of Days, so you can see the documentation there. But it was Hans Pedersen who did an experiment here in Hawaii. He went to Mauna Kea and put a filter above the top of Mauna Kea, four feet off the ground. And he measured the amount of dust coming through the filter. And he assumed that all that dust was cosmic dust. And he said, on that basis, if the moon is four and a half billion years old, it should be covered about 200 feet thickness in dust. And so people were saying, hey, we're going to go to the moon. We need to take this into account. Well, if you read the paper by Hans Pedersen, he says, you know, I'm assuming that all the dust going through my filter is cosmic dust. That may not be accurate. It's only four feet off the top of Mauna Kea. My experiment needs to be redone on high altitude balloons, or better yet, with satellites. Well, a few years later, they did those experiments and discovered his dust estimate was off by a factor of several thousand times. And so the satellite measurements basically told them that if the moon is four and a half billion years old, we would expect an average of 60 millimeters thickness of dust on the moon. And they also determined that uh, Hans Pedersen made a slight underestimate because it's not just cosmic dust falling on the moon, ultraviolet radiation on the moon also makes dust. But the total adds up to six millimeters, uh, 60 millimeters, if the moon indeed is four billion years old. When the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, what did they find? 60 millimeters of dust. And the creation said, yeah, we're not going to use that argument anymore. Uh, however, what they're not acknowledging is the fact that we found 60 millimeters moon means that the moon is not young. The other reason why we know the moon is not young, we see argon in the moon's atmosphere. That argon comes from potassium-40 decay. And potassium-40 decay has a half-life of 39 billion years. So to get that argon, and again, it shows that the moon is about four. All the dates for the moon come in at four and a half billion. Okay, I'll let you take a break, and uh, there'll be a talk coming up in a few minutes.